there, sports fans. Welcome to Hebsey on Sports, episode number 308. I'm your host, Mark Hebsher. Happy Friday to you. Uh, Toronto Mike is alongside, as per usual. Were he not, you, we wouldn't have a show. I'd be going, my lips would be moving, but you wouldn't hear anything. You might not even be able to see me. So Mike's here to do his thing, which is more than just the, uh, you know, the technical end. Uh, and uh, we're going to get into lots of stuff here today. Uh, if you could spend five minutes alone with Kyrie Irving, what would you do? I'm giving you five minutes. You and Kyrie in a room together. Uh, we could lock the door if you wanted to, or you, maybe you just want to talk. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. I'm shocked at what's going on, but I'm even more shocked that that very few NBA players have spoken out. You know, this is their league. This is the the perception. You know, as a lot, and this is one of their guys. And it's like, wouldn't you just like to? I don't know. Talk to him. Slap him upside the head. Uh, I'm, I'm really upset about this. Very upset. And he just apologized on Instagram last night after he was suspended. After they said, you're suspended for five games, you fuck you, Sarah. You, you haven't apologized. You've got to apologize. He's like, all right, I'll apologize. And he went on Instagram and apologized. The most insincere apology. <laughs> unbelievable. We'll get into that at length, this, this guy. When is a no-hitter not a no-hitter? When, when it's a faux no-hitter, a faux no-no, like the other night. Oh, it's a semantics to some. But I always ask one question. When I hear uh, a no-hitter was thrown, I always ask one question. And I'll bet you ask the exact same question. Someone says, hey, there was a no-hitter. You, you know what I'm it. talking about. We'll get into that. We'll get, hey, don't ruin it for everybody. Spoiler alert. Some people might say, I would like to know what was the final score of that no-hitter. No, maybe there's one or two people like that. I don't think so, though. The Raptors surprising a lot of people. Eh? Third best team in the East. Oh, it's early. But hey, they're doing it and they're doing it without Fred Van Vliet as well. Right? Just saying pretty good depth like this team. Very exciting to watch. And the Maple Leafs, speaking of exciting to watch, well, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Sometimes when Justin Hall gets the puck, we go, ah, ah, ah. Uh, Leafs have got an interesting weekend coming up as they try to live up to expectations and battle the uh, the the time difference, the 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 change, the the daylight savings time ends this weekend. So, you know, it's a, what time is it? Uh, they don't know to ship or wind their watches. Do they have watches? Does anybody wind their watch ever again? Um, the Blue Jays have one Gold Glove winner this year, and it's not Matt Chapman. Why? I can't explain it. It maybe you can. Huge sports weekend coming up. All kinds of stuff. We'll go over all that. But first, let's find out what uh, Toronto Mike has got planned because uh, there's no school. There's no school today. Uh, this isn't something that affects me anymore because my kids aren't school age. But for those who do, I feel, I feel for all of you, Mike, especially, you know, you got little ones. They're yeah. supposed to be learning in school. No school today, Hebsey. A lot of parents right now scrambling. What about Monday? Well, it, it, whenever this QP strike ends, they'll go back. And I, I think it'll be at least a week. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not expecting any school next week either. What's so? What's the over under on the strike? Like, oh, do you do you know? I'm saying, do you go by previous strikes? Do you like like in sports? You say, well, the last. I'll say what I do. I go thing. by. Uh, I ask my wife. I say, babe, how long is this strike going to go on for? And she says, oh, at least a week. And that's my uh, intel on the uh, topic. So. Uh, <laughs> But Hebsey, man, uh, I want to just quickly remark for those who are tuning in from Toronto and we have people from all over the world. Somebody's yeah. in London, England. Somebody's in Lethbridge. They're all over the place. But this fog, I just want to point out that uh, I, I, I know you live close enough to the water, not as close as I do. But uh, this fog has been pretty intense in this city lately. Yeah. Last night, yeah. I had a late night ride on the waterfront and it was like a movie. Like a horror movie. It was. Just... I saw. I saw your pictures. I saw your bike to hashtag. Yeah. No. It was. I was out as well, walking the streets, and it was a. It reminded me. There's. I think there's one scene in. Uh, was it the Crown or one of the ones about the Queen, where like uh, the, and the true story of the fog that didn't lift for like weeks in London. Right. Yes. It was, it was scary. It was stuff. the Crown. It was. The yeah, crown. It was. It was. It was good. Um, no, the other thing too is I planes can fly in the fog, right? Like they have the radar. They don't need to be able. To, pilots don't need to. Be able to be able to see right it, 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 it's not as big a deal instruments right yeah so i'm wondering um because uh serena's flying out uh, she's flying out to ottawa today and i'm thinking she's you know i wonder like you know how much of an effect or will there be an effect because of, of fog 
It's far more dangerous to drive in fog than to fly. Yeah, or bike. <laughs> well, Biking I, in fog can be. I was all right. Really? I, you know, I firstly the waterfront trail just for Torontonian. The best part about it is there's no cars on that trail, so right. no one's going to run you over. But you don't ride that trail on weekends, do you? Uh, like it depends. No, on no, the- it, into Toronto. Oh, no. What I'm saying to you because oh. it gets so busy. And it's not just cyclists, eh? It's runners, walkers, yeah, it's on a nice with day. strollers walking three across. It's getting <laughs> get pretty crazy down there. I've done that You're before. Right. You know, it tourists is. are out there. Oh, la di da. This is Toronto. You know, crazy. Okay, listen. Um, late last night, uh, yeah. I think I had gone to bed by then, or the World Series was still on. I wasn't paying attention. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brooklyn Nets guard Kyrie Irving was suspended for five games by the team uh, after posting a link to a wildly anti-Semitic documentary and, and then refusing to apologize to the Jewish community and others. Uh, and soon after the suspension was announced, Irving apologized on Instagram. Now the timing of this could not have been like, come on, I'm not apologizing. I'm not apologizing. I'm not apologizing Two press conferences, not going to apologize. Not, and now, okay. Now if this went from, you know, what's going to happen to this guy last Saturday to, Oh, we'll let him play a couple of games. We'll let people get their anger out. We'll see if other uh, people, what uh, if they denounce Kyrie. And here's a guy that's basically saying, well, there was a quote here. Oh, I'm not the one who made the documentary. Anyway, I don't want to rehash this whole thing. He was basically forced to apologize. He against his will. And he went on Instagram, which is what they do these days. Right. You know, yeah. he apologized on Instagram. Quote, Kyrie Irving. I want to clarify any confusion on where I stand fighting against anti-Semitism by apologizing for posting the documentary without context and a factual explanation outlining the specific beliefs in the documentary I agreed with and disagreed with, Irving wrote. So, you know, I guess saying, you know, he, he should have, but he didn't, still hasn't. Anyway, he goes on. No, he didn't go on. The Nets, I mean, because I'm not going to read his whole thing because it gives me a headache. When I even when I'm quoting him, um, so the Nets earlier had suspended him for they say at least five games, and here was their explanation. I'm quoting the Nets statement: "We were dismayed today, and when given an opportunity in a media session that Kyrie refused to unequivocally say he has no anti-Semitic beliefs, nor acknowledge specific hateful material in the film." End quote. Then the team added, he is unfit to be a part of the Nets organization at this time. Unfit. Now, apply that to any other situation in life, right? Unfit to be a parent. Unfit to uh, uh, stand trial because of your condition. Unfit. The team, unfit. Now, I would say he is unfit to be a part of this society that we live in without serious rehabilitation and a five game suspension an apology on Twitter on Instagram not, is not going to do it. But the problem here is, is that up to this point, what's happened is of his, I don't know how many millions of followers he has. Many of them have come out in his support on social media and it's nauseating to read some of, and scary as a Jew, I'm scared to read some of the comments of people not just supporting Kyrie, part of his army that he suggests that he has, and that he's a beacon, a shining light. It's starting to, it's it's getting, it's getting scary. And some elderly people that I've spoken to who had families that perished in the Holocaust. This is, offensive isn't anywhere near the word that I could use that would describe how these people are feeling right now. How about scared shitless? Because this is the way it started in Germany. There was no social media. It took a little, took a little longer for them to get their, their message out, the propaganda. But this, this, is, this guy has got to be stopped. He's dangerous. He's very, very dangerous. The best quote of all, I would say, comes from Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Quote, there's little hope that Kyrie will change because he's insulated by fame and money and surrounded by yes people. There is no motivation to learn how to distinguish propaganda from facts. All that's left is for the world to decide how it should respond to him. End quote. So, Mike, this guy's dangerous. 
This isn't just a basketball player who like doesn't do what his coach tells him like he did, like in Boston and the not, and doesn't get vaccinated. And, you know, I mean, this guy's dangerous. He's promoting hate and hate speech by promoting the documentary, even even sending a link to it. He doesn't understand how influential he is. Um, you know, we talked about uh, Lou Marsh like this, right? Remember? You know, Lou Marsh was very influential. And so who knows how many people read him and believed him and thought the way he did, you know, even though he was spreading lies, rumors, untruths, uh, you know. Um, oh, yeah. So, so the fact that Kyrie did not want to apologize on two previous occasions and had the opportunity to, you know, it's like that episode of Happy Days where Fonzie can't say I'm so, I was wrong. I was wrong. I, right? It's like that. I know, like, I get it. The male ego, whatever. Uh, it's hard to admit that you were wrong in front of other people. But the, the, the more you bury yourself, the more you dig this hole, the, the worse it gets, the scarier it gets. And, and he only said he was sorry, you know this, because he was being threatened with a longer suspension. Maybe he was threatened with expulsion from the league. I don't know. But as a Jewish person, I'm very worried he's added fuel to the inferno that is anti-Semitism and that the anger and the vitriol that's uh, directed towards Jewish people will continue, uh, even maybe more so because he's getting suspended and because he still has a platform. And I'm also disappointed, I'm really disappointed that more NBA players didn't come forward and denounce Kyrie. Uh, I've, Robin Lopez is the only one I, uh, you know, I haven't gone through like all my tweets and everything like that, but Robin Lopez, you know, basically came out. He was the only active NBA player, but no big names, you know, I mean, former NBA players, Charles Barkley, Shaq, they called him an idiot, but that's not enough. And like I said, this is the same as Lou Marsh. This is, you know, he, he got his name on an award. We didn't know that he was a bigot, a racist, an anti-Semite who influenced his readers for many years. Exactly the way we, we, we didn't know. What other stuff has Kyrie been saying? I, do I got to go through his whole timeline forever? The stuff he's been spewing out there and influencing his followers with lies and falsehoods about indigenous peoples, Jews, blacks. Draw your parallel to other influential people. Okay. My son's got Kyrie Irving shoes. He didn't want to wear them anymore. Right? Are there other people that are like that? Like, ah, the heck with it. We'll continue to, you know, ah, this will blow over. No. This is very, very worrisome, Mike. Very, very worrisome. There should be zero tolerance for anti-Semitism, uh, just like there should be zero tolerance for, you know, racism or homophobia, uh, Islamophobia, etc. I don't understand the delay in the NBA denouncing it and, and uh, the team. Like, I don't understand, what was it, a week or something? It just felt like yeah, it was hanging there. There seems be to be, listen, from a Gentile's perspective, I don't understand why there seems to be more tolerance for anti-Semitism than there is for other hate speech. Like Kanye West, that news was only in the last month and everybody's like, oh, he's unwell. And Kyrie, oh, he's an idiot. We don't, we shouldn't tolerate it for even a minute. There should be zero tolerance for anti-Semitism. Well, I mean, it's also a league that, remember, Robert Sarver, the owner of the Phoenix Suns and the Phoenix Mercury, uh, Donald Sterling, the owner of the Los Angeles uh, Clippers. Uh, these were men that have been, you know, had been, you know, basically kicked out, suspended, forced to sell the team. Get out of here. We don't want you at all. Those were sexist comments, racist comments. If they were anti-Semitic com comments, like, like, uh, you see, this is the other thing is that you've got a lot of people saying, no, Conway, he, Kanye never said that anything bad against the Jews. He never said that. He didn't say he just posted a link. This is the this is sort of um, the defense. He, right. he just posted a link. And we all know that retweets are not endorsements like stuff like that. Yeah. OK. Uh, OK. Who, who are his advisors? Who are the ones that are saying, you oh, know, you might want to walk this back a bit. But now it's too late. And even, even the timing of, you know, oh, he's been suspended, now he apologizes. So part of the suspension was we're suspending you only for five games at a minimum, but you've got to apologize. You have to. But, a, but an apology, an Instagram apology at whatever, 11 o'clock at night, come on, man. Get in front of a camera. Like, look the camera and say, like, be sincere. That's the other thing, too, is like just be sincere. Like, be a human being. 
very bothersome, like very, 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 bo- very disturbing. And very I, disturbing. I, and scary. I'm telling you this right now. Scary. Yeah. Scary. Because I don't want to think that, I don't know, young, impressionable people, Jewish, Muslim, uh, you know, Catholic, it doesn't matter that, that something like this is going to be a divide you know, in another subdivide, in, 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 you know, in the cultures, like, aren't we all supposed to like, get along? Like, like, why can't we find, can we find the Kyrie equivalent the other way in the NBA, someone that's just, you know, wants to get people together of different faiths and different backgrounds, as opposed to pitting them against each other. Oh, it's worse for blacks. It's worse for Jews. Like that to me is the worst part of it. Like, like for people to say, well, why, how come Jeff Bezos, doesn't get fined and suspended because he's allowing Amazon to sell this, you know, the, a copy of the documentary or the book. Like, how come the people, it, like that type of thing takes away from the problem. Instead of finger pointing, say, well, how come Jeff Bezos doesn't get it? Or how come the people at YouTube, how come they don't have to take that down? It's free speech. This is where it all gets muddled. This is where you just, you know, this is where you need leaders to, to get people together, right? People that are respected not the Kyrie Irvings of the world, but people that are respected, respected leaders. Okay. Because, and I got to tell you something, I, you know, uh, I, I don't know if I feel comfortable the same way. I didn't feel comfortable wearing Adidas while all this was going on with Kanye. Like, come on. The pressure was put on the pressure was put on the jet, the nets, the pressure has been put on the NBA NBA blew this. They blew it. This is bad. Now, right off the bat, they should have gone out there and said, all right, we're having a hearing with Kanye, with Kanye, with Kyrie, and we're going to make a decision, and he's going to be punished because this cannot go on. It, it, I will just point out there's there's a slippery slope I think between conspiracy theories like uh, let's say flat Earth, flat Earthers, and hate and anti-Semitism and dangerous uh, racism, etc., bigotry. It's such a uh, I've noticed the correlation there. So you know your friend who thinks uh, I don't know. That believes in that crazy conspiracy theory. Uh, there seems to be an event diagram: the conspiracy theory, flat earthers, and then the racists are like one big circle. Just anyway, uh, I, 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 I want to edge. I'm inter- I want to educate myself. I want to. I'm interested to know how many people believe in the this theory that Kanye and this film that he just got. How many people believe this? And I, I don't want to go into what the the untruths are because there are many and, and they're they're wild, wildly inaccurate. But uh, I'm wondering how many people subscribe to this. Like, yeah, man, I believe that. And I wonder how much of it is rooted in hate, hatred. Sure. And what happened to you in your life and your ancestors, um, how you can compare that, you know, that was worse than the life you're talking about or. The, you know, you know, oh, I didn't offend anyone. Well, yeah, you did. You just did. You're just you're just uneducated. You're ignorant. You're lazy and lazy, meaning you didn't take the time to do the research, like read about it. And that really is the crux of all of it is you didn't take the time. Did you sit and watch that film, Kanye, or Kanye Kyrie, or did you like watch a snippet of it? And go, oh, yeah, I've heard that. Maybe you grew up thinking that maybe that's the way it was in your neighborhood, in your culture. That's what you were taught. These people are bad. These people are good. What happened to you should never happen again. Stand up for your rights. Uh, Maybe it wasn't taught that, you know, but but be sympathetic or empathetic to other peoples who may have gone through similar struggles. Okay. (sighs) Well said, Hebsey. Well said, buddy. I'm scared, Mike. I'm scared. Well, the zero tolerance, the zero can go on this. If he's allowed to come back and sort of, yeah, okay, I served my suspension or whatever, but I still think this way. And so should you be careful, be aware. Uh, I don't, I don't like that. Okay. Last night stayed up till, I don't know, was it almost midnight? These games just take forever and ever. Houston Astros, one win away from a world series championship after beating Philadelphia three, two last night in game five and full Delphia, Justin Verlander, finally, Got his first World Series win in his ninth start, just one night after four Houston pitchers combined to no hit the Philadelphia Phillies in game four. Now, for all those who call that performance a no hitter, you're wrong. It's not a no hitter. It's a combined no hitter. It's kind of like 
you go to bowl a perfect game and you rule 10 strikes in a row and then you break your ankle and they bring in a substitute and then he rolls the 11th strike and then he hurts himself and then you bring in another substitute and he rolls the 12th one and you've got a perfect game. Well, you started it, but you didn't finish it. So you get credit for a portion of it, but it's not really a perfect game. So this particular thing is called a combined no-hitter. And years ago, back in the 80s, there was one, and I, I think Francisco Barrios of the White Sox was involved. And I don't know, there was like two or three guys that I said, oh, that's a faux no-hitter. It's not a real no-hitter, like fake fur. It's not real. Looks like it, but it's not the, the real thing. If someone said to you, Mike, yeah. hey, they just th- a no-hitter was just thrown. What's your first question? Who threw it? Yeah, not not... What was the final score or yeah. what was the, which team got no hit? And the answer you expect is one name. Kershaw, throw it. Who, who threw it? Not, you know, oh, yeah, it's four guys for Houston. Really, really, second time this year that four Houston pitchers have combined for a no hitter. Okay, that's good. Uh, look, Octavio Dotel was part of a no hitter where six, six different guys right. combined for the no hitter. Now, come on. The other team didn't get a hit. So the team, the team that was the losing team, they, they didn't get a hit. They were no hit. They were no hit, but there was not a no hitter thrown by six guys. It's, it's got to be one guy. That's all there is to it. If I may, if I may, Hebsey man, the Astros threw a no hitter in that game. Like the, 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 the Astros no hit the Phillies in that game. I tuned Whatever. in the sixth inning when I heard there was a no, no going on. But the Astros did no hit the Phillies like this whole idea that that's not a no hitter. I mean, of course, it's not it's not Don Larson, you know, pitching a perfect game. No, that's a perfect the, game. That's their yeah, well, yeah. But but, 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 but listen yeah. to this. But but listen to this yeah. for years. Like like I think I think it happened like in like the original combined no hitter or whatever was in 1917. Like Babe Ruth starts the game, walks the leadoff batter, argues with the umpire who says, you, you know, that he was making bad calls punches the umpire and gets kicked out of the game. That is a runner at first, nobody out first inning. Ernie Shore comes in. Got this. I'm with you. Just got kicked out of the game. Walk the leadoff batter, punch the umpire gone. Ernie Shore comes in the batter, the batter runner at first base, the guy who walked gets mm-hmm. thrown out trying to steal. And Ernie Shore goes on to retire the next 26 batters in a row. Wow. Now that to me, Okay. Oh, that's different. That's like two guys. I'll pitch six innings. You pitch an inning. You pitch an inning. You pitch an inning. That's different. That was like, holy cow, that's wild. But that doesn't happen. That's not, that to me, that to me goes down as that's a no hitter, right? That's like, actually, it's a perfect game because he retired all 27. But anyway, that's, so- that's, that's semantics. But in this case, in the case of all of these no hitters that were thrown, like yeah. almost all of them were thrown by one guy. Sure. For years yeah. and years and years, it was like one guy. And then, and then as the, 2000, the 90s and the 2000s came along and pitching became different, you had your, you know, eight innings for this guy, one inning for that guy, you know, right. seven innings for that. And then you started having, you know, five innings, then an inning, then an inning, then an inning. And then you had guys that threw no hitters that walked seven guys or 11 guys. One guy threw a no hitter and walked 11. Right. But it's a no hitter because he didn't yeah. give up a hit. But he right. gave up 11 base runners. So, yeah, okay. But to me... When someone says, hey, there was a no-hitter thrown, the first question is, who threw it? And the answer should be one person. That, to me, is a no-hitter. Anything else is a combined no-hitter, a faux no. <laughs> Not a no All these rules, Hebsey. Hebsey, I understand your take on this. I appreciate it. But as far as I'm concerned, that was a no-hitter that the Astros – the Astros no-hit the Phillies. It was a no, only the second no-hitter – in World Series history, and is it as impressive or exciting as the old school no hitters when the guy completes the game? Of course not. This is much under you know four guys combined on this no hitter, but it's still a no hitter. That's no. all I'm here to say. No, it's not. They have four guys combined on no. It's not. It's a combined. It's a combination. You combine to do something to allow zero hits. You didn't throw a no hitter. He no. didn't throw a no hitter. A right. bunch of you got together to throw a no hitter. The team threw a no hitter. On. And the it's Phillies the were no hit. individual accomplishments. How many Sandy Koufax threw four no hitters? Four, right? He, he, not once, okay. But trust me if I tell you this, yeah, not once did the manager Walter Alston ever consider, 
ever consider taking him out, not for a split second. Of course not. Because he had a no hitter going. So this is why I say to you, there should be a rule. There should be a new rule in baseball. You want to keep the fans. You want to keep them excited. This is the rule. Okay. A pitcher cannot be taken out of the game unless he's injured. Cannot be taken out of the game if he has not allowed a hit <laughs> through five innings or more. I love it. That's the rule. It'll never happen. It cannot. So the manager's like, oh, i got to take him out. Of the nope, not allowed. Because the fans here came to see excitement, magic, perhaps an historical game. And you can't say to fans who've been sitting waiting, he's got a no hitter going. I, I mean, this could be history. So you're not allowed. So how about that? I love it. These five innings. And if you have an, if you have not allowed a hit after five innings, you may not be taken out of the game. Once you've given up that hit, right? You no know, hitter's gone. Go have it off. But no, right. that's my rule for next year. <laughs> that's a fan rule because fans, I know I personally went when they pulled the guy after six, and I knew they were gonna do it after six or seven, Everybody but when they pulled knew. after six, I was like. Like, oh, remember how fun it used to be when you'd, you know, you know, they, you'd got to see the guy finish his no hitter. Like those days are so long gone. I can't imagine a Blue Jay pitching a complete game anymore, let alone a no hitter. Like I can't imagine a complete game. The game has changed, Mike. Big time, big time. The game has changed. And I'll give you an example. And by the way, congratulations to Vladdy Guerrero Jr. for winning the American League Gold Glove Award at first base. First time a Blue Jay first baseman uh, has ever won uh, the Gold Glove at that position. Do you, know who, do you know who won it last year? Who won the gold glove last year for the Blue Jays? There was one gold glove winner last year. I can't remember. That was our second baseman, Marcus Simeon. Right. He was the guy. Right. Um, so Vladdy wins it at first, which is great. And uh, Mike, I'm pretty sure. And I'm not the type to go, let's go back into the archives and find the time that Hebsey said that. I <laughs> but it was last season, not this year. It was last season when he, Vladdy had started and he had made some tremendous plays. And, and I'm pretty sure I'd said something to the effect of this guy going to win a gold glove. He's got range. He's got as much range of more than anyone I ever seen at first base. This guy can cover so much ground and he's just gotten better and better. And I, I'm pretty sure I'd said something to the effect of this guy could win a gold glove. You did say day. that. I remember you. Because when it. they moved him from, from third to first, you're thinking, okay, they got to find a place for this guy to play. Like we were not thinking that he was going to be a good defender. We, we were hoping for adequate, right? Because we had seen him play third. But man, he's turned himself into a man. Good for him. But here's the shocking part. How does Matt Chapman not win the gold glove at third base? Okay. Ramon Urias of the Orioles, who, who played half as many games as Matt Chapman and made more errors. But the defensive metrics that they come up with, or I don't know, this year with the voting, I don't know, man. You're talking about a three-time gold glove winner, Chapman, who was nearly flawless for the Jays this year. And he doesn't win the gold glove. And the guy that beats him is Ramon Urias, who they're now comparing with Manny Machado and Brooks Robinson. Get the fuck out of here. Come on. And even, even like, even like, I know his teammates, there were others kind of going away in a second. I just saw the gold glove voting. And I think there's 14 players that won for the first time. And you don't, it, they don't go by just fielding percentage. There's other, you know, metrics and well, I don't know how they come up with it. Right. But I'm sorry, Matt Chapman is a gold glover. Okay. Convince me otherwise. You sold me, Hebsey. The fix is in. Right. Uh, World Series, by the way, uh, resumes uh, tomorrow, Saturday in Houston, and then Sunday, if necessary, is game seven. And I'm not saying this right now. If the, if the Phillies could win two games in Houston, that would be unbelievable. Okay. I don't want to see the Astros win. I don't like the Astros. The Astros are like the Kyrie Irving of baseball. Ugh. I it's find tough. that a very dislike, uh, unlikable team. I mean, I would basically, I think, I don't know. I'm wondering now, like, if yeah. Is, is there any other team? I, yeah, I think the Phillies yeah. I've been rooting for because I just distaste the, uh, just like yeah. the. Uh, like, but we would root for anybody against Houston. Yeah, right? that's what I was thinking. But yeah, I don't. Yeah. When the Yankees play Houston, I just hope they suspend the game due to rain or something. I, you know. Yeah. I root, it, I root for the rain. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm not. Uh, listen, I'm not. a. I don't root for Justin Verlander or guy. Like, he's he's done fine. He's done OK for himself. Justin Verlander. Okay, married Kate Upton, kid with Kate Upton, right? He's going to win the Cy Young this year. He's living the life, Hebsey. We can only uh, imagine. Good for him. Let's talk about the Toronto Maple Leafs. Oh, did I mention big win the other night? Could have been a tough loss, but it was a big win. But now, every broadcast now, 
every broadcast, okay, somebody throws the question, is this a must-win game? And I'm like, oh, come on. So come silly. on. And I realize that now that the people are involved here, and I've explained this before, is every game is, an, is, is a show, right? Every game, you've got to have okay. meaning. There has to be a theme. There has to be th- something to, to distinguish this game, this 10th game of the season, from all the other games, right? Right. And it just becomes so tedious and all that. And I want to turn it off, but I, I can't help it. I just, I want to listen and watch to see what, like, what are they doing? Half hour pregame show. Let's go to the panel. What do we get? Marner. Here's an old clip of Marner when he was eight years old and his father not buying him a hot chocolate or a pup. And this is why Mitch Marner's having problems. In. And if I left the bench, if anybody ever left my bench, they'd never be allowed back on the bench. <laughs> but you're a professional you are leaving the bench to break your stick and coming back. You're benched for four minutes. Okay, I need you to go back and begin. All this stuff. Oh, my God. And it's it's true. Leafs Twitter is the worst. The worst. <laughs> and you know who I blame for all this? All of it. Me. Steve Dangle. Okay. All of it. Because he goes so overboard, right? Okay. Yeah. You That's can, a shtick. You can feel that way on occasion about your team. But you cannot maintain that pace. You'll kill yourself. Dangle's going to kill himself. He's going to have a million people and they're going to watch as he dies of a heart attack live on the air on YouTube. Right? <laughs> Something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, I'm kidding here, obviously. But I'm worried. This is what worries me is, is that this influence, because he's very influential, is, is we're growing in, um, a generation of Maple Leaf fans are panic-stricken anxiety ridden biting fingernails to the bone clutching pearls game 10 for game 10 of the season is this how you prepare yourself if you keep this pace up you'll (laughs) never last in the playoffs you're going to burn out before the playoffs like the players trust me if i tell you this i traveled with this team many 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 years i did and i'm here to tell you as someone who never played a minute of hockey never laced the skates up all this time I was exhausted by the end. <laughs> I, I exhausted the travel, the the schedule. That, right? I cannot imagine what it's like for the players. Right? Well, that's why they bow out in the first round. They can get it over. I can't with. imagine what it's like. Get to the golf course. Yeah, and you can't say to a guy, "Hey, buddy, it's October. Take it easy. Relax. Pace yourself. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint." Oh no, no, not when the fans and the media and social media are screaming and yelling. Yeah, you yeah, haven't scored any goals. So okay. Steve Dangle, who, who seems like a nice guy, and he's, he's visited me. In the I've basement. never met him before. I, listen, I watch his stuff for a couple minutes. My freaking blood pressure goes through oh, the yeah, roof. See, I, my heart starts this. to beat out of my chest. I go, I can't, I can't watch this. I can't <laughs> I watch it. What happens if they lose to the Flyers? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. Like, he's a lot. Like, my, 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 my son, like, I think, well, six years ago when he was, like, 14 or something, liked Steve Dangle. But even my son, who's now only 20 years old, has right. outgrown it. Like at 20 years old, he's outgrowing that. It's just, it's just a lot. It's like a pneumatic drill when there's a leaf game on. <laughs> right? It's a, anyway. Anyway, it's look, they got that win against seven. Philly. That's good. When they're winning, the other thing is too, when they're winning, you know, the, the tone goes like it's down when they're winning. Yeah. It's down. It's, it's, all, okay. all it's, okay. it's, okay. it's all right. It's okay. It's maintainable. But, but any blip, a loss, okay? A loss, especially a loss when you've blown a lead. Like, to a oh, bad oh, team. To a bad team. So they get that much needed victory against Philadelphia, that big win. And now they've got the big bad Bruins and then the Hurricanes back to back this weekend. So Saturday night, the Leafs host Boston at the Scotiabank Arena. And then before they go to bed Saturday night, and they'll and that'll be in Raleigh, North Carolina, because mm-hmm. they'll fly out after the game. And then they'll gain an hour of sleep so that's good they'll need that and then the next afternoon in raleigh at five o'clock eastern standard time which is really six o'clock from the day before that your body is going to kind of feel um carolina and leafs freddie anderson the expected starter in goal for carolina and do we wish we had freddie anderson back on this team mike in goal uh does it matter like uh I, I, i do you <laughs> I don't know. I guess Sam- you know. Samsonov's doing okay. Was yeah, it Samsonov who was in goal? Or was the other guy? Who was the other guy? I was at a. Who's our other goalie? I don't even know. Matt Murray Shul- is he back? Shulgren. Is Matt Murray oh, back? No. Shalgren. That's Shulgren. right. Shalgren. 
Shalgren is playing, he's going to play against Freddie Anderson, Shalgren. Right. Not, not, not an NHL goalie, Shalgren. So we can hardly wait for Matt Murray to come back. He's been on the injured list since, have we seen him play? Did he even play a game for the Leafs? Two games? Uh, he was in practice or something. And some Practice? Like he was on, he was at uh, down the street at the Mark Matt, at the Ford Center. Yeah, Allen Iverson. Uh, I don't know, man. Um, but I yes. think uh, I I don't know how you can make the ruling on Shelgren so early. Like like you've already not decided. An, not an NHL goalie. You've watched him, haven't you? Did you think James Reimer was an NHL goalie? Yeah, yeah. Shelgren's not an NHL goalie. He's more. He, just he, he may become. He may become. May become a goalie. May become. But he needs to be great in the minors, man. But the only he's the third string goalie. Think about that. He wasn't part of their plans. He was a Marley. Now he's a Leaf. He's a pogey, not a not a Rask. <laughs> Something like that. Hey, how about the Raptors, huh? They got more and more people coming to me going, oh, yeah, I wasn't, you know, they sort of snuck up on me, but hey, wow. You know, because remember, it's been several months, you know, disappointing loss of the playoffs last year. What's going to happen this season? And, you know, I think they uh, kind of snuck up on some people. They're off to a five and three start. They're in Dallas tonight to play the Mavs, fresh off a couple of blowout victories in which Nick Nurse has been able to utilize just about every player on the bench. Like, I think he went like 13 deep the other day. Uh, and what with the absence of Fred Van Vliet, who's got back issues. And I've been saying all this all along. The guy, I mean, I'm pretty sure Fred Van Vliet led the NBA in minutes played or was one of the top minutes played players, right? I mean, he's, he's not a big guy. And, and, you know, he's not getting any younger. And you got to find players to, to spell this guy. Or, you know, anyway, he's got a bad back and that's never good. The pounding that this guy takes. I mean, think of the times that he goes in the lane and takes on the big guys and hits the deck. And that's got to be tough. If you've got any back, if you've ever had any back issues, and I had, I had a double laminectomy done. I had bulging discs. It was horrible. But I can't imagine pounding, pounding, pounding away on the hardwood like these guys do with a bad back. That's tough. man. Lowry-esque. Anyway, yeah. Anyway, tonight, uh, tonight the problem is going to be this guy, uh, Luka Doncic. This guy is unbelievable, amazing, 23 years old. Mike, do you know that the other night when he dropped 33 points and 11 assists on Utah, he became the third player in NBA history to start the season with seven consecutive 30-point games? Okay? Seven in a row, 30-plus. Wow. How do you stop this guy? Wow. You, just, you know what it is? You hope to keep him under 30 points. I, I want to see what kind of defensive scheme they use on this guy, the big Slovenian. Okay. Because what will happen is if they, I mean, if he's harassed too much, he's a phenomenal passer. He's the kind of guy that as soon as you get the double team or, on him, he finds the open man. Okay. He, he's triple threat player. He's fantastic. Watch the game tonight just to watch him and see if, I don't know. I'm thinking here, Scotty Barnes is a great defender. Pascal's a great defender. Precious is a great defender. You know, OG is a terrific defender. He might be, a, you know, an all-defensive uh, NBA player one day, maybe this year. But this Doncic is terrific and fun to watch. He's a very creative player. Very, very exciting. Big fan. Really enjoying the Raptors. Really well, loving this team. Yeah, those were, those were big, big, big wins. Uh, I got to just shout out Brian on the YouTube channel who's got his eye on Felix right now, apparently. Oh, yeah, Felix break. is playing right now. Francis Tiafo, what's going early on? Early break for Felix. That was Good. the update I got. So, I think uh, Felix is a better... I think he's beaten... I, I think the last time they played, Felix beat him pretty good. Uh, Tiafo, and I'm trying to think when that was, but uh, he's the... Felix is playing... I tell you, he was almost out of it the other day in the third round, I guess it was. He was in big trouble. He was down a set, and, and I think he was down a set and down 4-1. Won four in the uh, in the in the second and came back and won it and then won won uh, in the tiebreaker in the third. The kid yeah. is hot. Fifteen consecutive matches he has uh, won. Fifteen consecutive matches. Yesterday beat Jill Simon six one six three, and Felix is now qualified for the season ending ATP finals later this year. Uh, Denny Shapovalov went out in the second round, I think, of this of uh, this tournament. I, mean, I tell you what. Shepo's been playing some pretty good things. He started the year very poorly. He's been playing much better lately, much better. The one thing, like with a lot of these players, you've got to uh, limit your, your, your unforced errors. I mean, Felix and Dennis. Felix the other day had some real problems. He got away with it, but he kept, I guess he kept trying to, you know, you want to hit the line 
hit the corner or up the line with power. Right. And a lot of times, you know, when you go for that winning shot, the kill shot, you know, uh, you got to be precise. And if you're off a little bit, you know, um, and you're trying to hit that winner all the time, as opposed to, you know, keeping it in play or, or forcing your opponent off the court so that you get them on the next shot or the next shot, you're more patient. The great players are patient. You know, you watch Djokovic, man, he'll, you know, go ahead, man. You get into a 30 shot rally with this guy. And he's thinking on shot number 25, the way he's going to beat you on shot 30. Like, like chess. Yeah. He creates a bit of an angle, creates a bit of, he's thinking ahead, creates a bit of an angle. And then I'm going to get you off the court, right? I'm going to run you. You're going to get to it, but you're going to hit a high one, a lob, and I'm going to smash it. And if not, if it's deep enough, then I'll get you on the next one by running you on the other side of the court, that type of thing. Easy. It's easy to say when you're sitting watching at home, a lot tougher when you're a player, but I enjoy what I'm enjoying watching because I love this type of tennis. I like the aggressive tennis. I like the, you know, serve and volley occasionally you're coming to the net and both Chapo and Felix are, are good net players. They played a fair bit of doubles and they're good. And that's the game now, man. You can't just bang from the baseline. Does Felix have- thought- oh, I'm sorry for interrupting here. I got a, a, does Felix make a, uh, what's your prediction? Uh, does he make a grand slam final in 2023? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say so. Yeah, Chapeau's already been to a Grand Slam final. I think Felix definitely. Def- Look, he's won three straight. I mean, and this, and he's into the, I mean, this is the quarterfinals of a, of a, of a 1,000 event. So you're talking the best players. Now you're talking Djokovic. You're, Nadal is already out, but Djokovic, Med, Medvedev is out, right? You've got, you've got a lot of really talented players. You've got Tsitsipas. You've got, uh, uh, yeah, there's lots, lots of good. But players. Chapeau didn't make a final, did he? No. Uh, Wimbledon final, didn't he? Oh, semi, 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 semi-final, semi-final, yeah, semi-final. semi-final. You're right, you're right. Um, one. Yeah, would be great. Felix, uh, and remember too, Felix had not won a tournament. I believe Felix was 0 for 8 in finals uh, coming into this year, and he's won four tournaments this year, three in a row. Wow, wow, well, and and periodically on Hebsey on Sports, like every quarter or so, I like to take the pulse. Okay, so again, you already have your crystal ball out, Hebsey man. Mm. What's the next? Toronto-based team, we're excluding, we're excluding the Argos, okay? The next Toronto-based team, <laughs> I'm sorry, Argos, but there's only eight teams, so it's like, okay. What's the next Toronto-based team to win a championship? What does your crystal ball say? To win a championship? Yeah, like, like the Raptors did in 2019. So that was the last team to do so. Ooh. Win a championship. So like a World Series, yeah, an NBA World championship, Series, a Stanley, Stanley Cup. Cup. Right, basically, yeah. Those mm, none. None. Ever? <laughs> No, um, the next one to win a championship will be the, the, the Blue Jays. Okay. I'm always curious where, where your head is at for who's the Blue Jays. It will be the Blue Jays because if they're close enough this year, they'll get, they'll get the free. Well, I'm saying this coming year, then they'll go and get the free agent, make the trade, do what has to be done and, and, and go for it. The all in thing. Like seeing the Astros and their, their no hitter combined no hitter uh, as we call it with the four pitchers, but seeing their relief core, like it, you realize how far we really are in terms of relievers. Like yeah. the, the Jays have some uh, work to do. They definitely have work to do. Uh, look, it'd be great if you had some horses in there, like Manoa, who's going to go seven every time for you. Right, makes it a lot easier. But if not, then you got to play that role. And if you've got power arms, and look, we had Romano. Right. Yeah. And we thought, hey, the other guys are good. Mays is all right. And, you know, Jimmy Garcia is all right. Are these, you know, Phelps, not nearly no, not like these guys compared no. to some of these guys. When you've got a bullpen that everybody can hit 100. Right. And this Presley, I mean, and then they've got four pitches, the wicked pitches. You're, you've got no, it's like you've got no chance in the ninth inning. It's like you're coming up there, like, give me a canoe paddle because these guys are electric and they're only expected to pitch an inning. It's like, give me 15 pitches. Go have at it, okay? And now you see a hellacious fastball at 100, right? And then that dropped out curve from the side that comes in from the back door at, at 88, right? And then a hard slider at 92. Are you kidding me? Okay, now I think I'll run the four seamer up and in to keep you off the plate. Now it's one and two. And now you're thinking, I have no idea what this guy's going to throw. I have no idea. I'm selling out on the fastball. And you're selling out on the fastball. And it's a change. It's a fourth pitch. These guys, they all have it, right? And well, it sounds pitch- like because you think the Jays are going to be next, it sounds like you don't think uh, the Raptors have it. They would need some kind of like, 
you know, in 2019, we had that one year with Kawhi Leonard and we had that one superstar that put us over the top. Like, it sounds like Masai needs to pull another rabbit out of the hat. Well, it depends how the team does this year. If they gel with the lineup that they have. I mean, look, Siakam is already a superstar. Scotty Barnes is on his way to being a superstar. I mean, Van Vliet is solid. Trent Jr. is a heck of a player. OG's, a, I, you know, I don't have to, there's, you've got some really good players. You stay injury free, you could do things. But to me, I like them as a team. I'm not looking at one individual going, if this guy is not playing well, the team is screwed. Like if Siakam doesn't have it, right, in the playoffs, if he doesn't have it, do they have enough of a core that, 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 that they can still win without him being at his best, that type of a thing? And that's going to take time. That's, you know, you're 10 games in, eight games in, whatever. But from what I see now, it's exciting. It's and you don't think the Leafs can, uh, if you know, can do it. There's no evidence that they can actually go in a long playoff run. No, I don't see any evidence they can go in a long playoff run. You've got to have great goaltending, right? You got really great goaltending. And with that comes great defense because more so in hockey, like you can't look at the Edmonton Oilers. They could score their asses off. Hey, they, they had a big lead last night and they blew it. They lost to New Jersey. So you can have scores galore, but if you don't have defense, like Edmonton was awful. Like they gave up, they gave up a goal. They were up three, one, they gave up a goal to make it three, two. And then off the ensuing face off, off the face off, they got to break away and score it again to tie it three, three. It's unbelievable. You've got to be able to play D and I see the Leafs as that type of a team. They're very capable of coughing up two fast goals. Goalie lets one through his legs, let's say, or plays a bad angle or the defense allows too good a shot. And then off the face off, they're capable of that. So if you're going to score, like I said, if you're going to score lots of goals, Right. You bet. I mean, you better if you're going to win those games, you better win them seven, four or whatever it is, uh, because, yeah, you got to have that defense. And I just don't see the Leafs as that team, that type of team that they don't have that defense. Hey, lots going on. OK, big, big sports weekend. Uh, if you want to camp out in front of the television, although it's going to be gorgeous, you want to get up and play golf, want to go play crosswinds or like good luck getting tea time too. better check it out. It's tough. It's going to be gorgeous. I'm going to play uh, Saturday and I'm going to play Monday as well. But if you're in front of the television this weekend and you're a college football fan for the only the fifth time in history, uh, the a uh, Associated Press's top two teams will play against each other. Uh, that's number two, Georgia against number one, Tennessee oh. Saturday. That's big. Wow. Now, let me give you an example how big that is. Okay. Um, the cheapest seat for that game at Georgia is $626 US. Some seats are going for over 5,000 US. That's a regular season meeting between Georgia and Tennessee. Well, that just tells you some people have too much money. No, it, what it tells you is how rabid college football fans are. Come on, Mike. We don't have okay. anything like That's that a year in this country. Tuition for we some have kids. nothing like that in this country, Mike. <laughs> nothing like it in no. there is no way, unless you've experienced it live, what right. it's like being at a college football game at a big school with like ninety thousand people at the game. It's yeah, there's nothing crazy. in this country. And it's not that gets just the game. People not just it. the game, Mike. It's the whole lead up all week to it. It's the tailgate parties. It's the after parties. It's everything. Right. And not only that, you got uh, Tennessee quarterback Hendon Hooker, the greatest name. The greatest name ever. Hendon Hooker is the favorite to win the Heisman Trophy. No Tennessee volunteer player has ever won the Heisman Trophy. You know who came the closest, Mike? Uh, I only know because uh, I did see this stat from you, but it's uh, Peyton Manning. That's right. Peyton Manning should have won the Heisman in 97. He won every other award, but uh, the Heisman went to Charles Woodson of Michigan. So no Thank Tennessee you. volunteer has ever won the Heisman Trophy. Unbelievable. They're number one in the nation. Elsewhere, oh, you got game six of the World Series in Houston. That's uh, Saturday night, 8 o'clock on Fox. Uh, you've got, to, if you're a soccer fan, uh, domestically, the MLS Cup final is LAFC against Philadelphia. That's at 4 o'clock on Fox. On what Saturday. a time to be a, a Philadelphia. The, the Hebsey on Sports equivalent for Philadelphia must be having a blast these days. Oh, my God. Yeah, the, yeah whoever the guy is in Philly <laughs> that's doing that show, for sure. Uh, if you're a NASCAR fan, and who isn't? Uh, you got the championship at Phoenix. That's Sunday afternoon. If you're an NFL fan, Buffalo Bills fan, who is it? Wow. The Bills are at Great the team. Jets. The Jets are pretty good this year. They lost last week. The Jets, that's Sunday afternoon, one o'clock on CBS. You got the Rams and the Bucks. That's the CBS uh, uh, Sunday uh, late afternoon game. Rams, Bucks. That's Tom Brady. 
who uh, just this week uh, uh, announced, I guess, or was announced that he is divorced from his wife, uh, Giselle Bunchen. So he hinted at that a few times. He said a few things like, I'm 45 year old man. I got, I got shit I'm dealing with or whatever. Like you could tell. Well, he already took time off this year, right? He had, you know, yeah. he had Some took personal time off. Don't you remember people were like, what? what? Who does that? Like, yeah, I think the writing was on the wall there because I think like in many families at a certain point, the family goes, okay, uh, what's your number one priority? Is it us or is it what you've already achieved uh, more than anyone else could ever possibly do? Or could you walk away from that? I guess that had a lot to do with it. Well, father time is going to force him out anyway. I feel like uh, he looks gaunt. He family. looks terrible. He looks like he hasn't eaten because he doesn't even eat strawberries. Too he much looks sugar. terrible. He looks frail out there. The man needs a hamburger. Lots of international soccer this weekend. I'll be watching my Spurs Sunday hosting Liverpool. Uh oh, what a weekend! Uh, Chelsea, Chelsea playing host to Arsenal, who are top of the table. We hate Arsenal. Lots of uh, lots of great activity. Wow. All right, you guys have a good weekend, Mike. Uh, everybody, listeners, it's uh, we're done. Episode three hundred eight of Hebsey on Sports is in the books officially. Now, thanks to Toronto Mike for production and inspiration. Hit him up at Toronto Mike. Make sure you listen to his excellent podcast featuring long form interviews of famous and not so fam famous and infamous Torontonians like Steve Simmons, the controversial writer uh, with the Toronto Sun. Excellent sit down interview with Steve, who explains a lot of things, actually apologizes, unlike some people. Well, apologize to Wayne, not to Akeem. What's Tune that, in, everybody? Well, just clarifying, Steve Simmons apologized to Wayne Simmons, but did not apologize to Akeem Alou. Right. Yeah. Well, that's who he should have apologized to, Steve, to, to Wayne Simmons, because Wayne Simmons shouldn't even, his name shouldn't even have been oh. involved. People should listen, because there's uh, a lot of people feel that Akeem Alou is, uh, deserves an apology as well. Hmm. Tune in, everybody. Oh, there you go. There's a teaser. Yeah, listen to Mike's uh, Mike's interview with uh, Steve Simmons. What number is that, Mike? Do you remember? 1142. 1142. There you go. All right. Um, and thanks to you, folks, for allowing us into your headspace. Really, really enjoy having you listening to the show. Uh, and um, yeah, you know, we love you here, man, every Friday. Back with another episode next week. Until then, so long for now. <laughs>